by the way, all sort of separate and all this other stuff. But uh, let's see, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this keto carnivore space. And then we're going to, we got a lot of questions and I'm sure you got a lot yeah. to throw, throw away. I appreciate it. Well, the beginning uh, with the keto carnivore was, I, I got to go back to 2018, I guess, when I was, you know, kind of diagnosed with heart disease. And I was about 245, 250 pounds, depending on where, when you weighed me, you know, and doctors are doing the whole high cholesterol, cholesterol is too high, you know, you're, and my wife was anti statins. She was on board with statins long before I even knew the literature about it or saw Dr. David Diamond's stuff about it or anything yep. like that. So I started looking into it and a buddy of mine lost 50 pounds on keto. I didn't know what keto was. I've said it before. I thought it was a martial arts thing or CrossFit, something that I wasn't going to like, right? You know, so I was like, ah, oh, keto. And he, he started talking to me about burning fat for fuel. And it was so foreign to me, man. I didn't under, I was like, what? And I wasn't a bio, you know, chemistry guy or anything. You know, I was a cop writing dumb police reports for dumb juries, right? So I was like, all right, let me look into it. So I read up on it. Because he was doing things on the basketball court I hadn't seen, you know, losing 50 pounds. And he was already a previous like college athlete. He was going back, not to that level, but a lot better than all the other 50 year olds I was playing with. And I looked it up. I went right to ketogenic.com. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know any groups or anything. And I started reading up on it. It made a lot of sense to me, you know. I go, well, let me try some of these recipes. And I'll lay off the sodas and all that stuff. And, you know, with about... I think a month or two in, I was bound 20 pounds, pretty easy wow. in the wow. beginning for me. I mean, I stay active. And then after six months, it was, it was 50 pounds. And that was my 30 high school reunion. I went back and I was lighter at that than I was in high school. So it was Ooh. crazy. You know, like I felt like the freaking bomb, right? You know, like, <laughs> man, check me out. Everyone else is losing hair. I got hair. Everyone else is heavy and I'm not heavy. So it was pretty cool. Not that it's about that, but I felt really good. And you know, my brain was good. Everything was just clean, man. And, you know, I saw a couple of videos with uh, like Mercola and Saladino. And then I started following these different groups and people posting different doctors from Dr. Ken Berry to Nina Teicholt's book, you know, Big Fat Surprise. And it just, man, I walked into this whole world that just blew my mind. And carnivore knocked the next 25 pounds off. So I got down to 180 pounds, man. And I hadn't seen that since like eighth grade. It's, it's tremendous. I've maintained it for four years now. I mean, it's this is what I should have been like my whole life. This, you know, unless you want to increase, you know, strength training, put more weight on for muscle or something like that. But this this is my happy zone. 180, 185, you know. So, man, that's pretty much the short of it, you know, but there's a lot more in there. And and you started um, sharing the stories and, and blogging. Is this was that after you went into keto carnival well, world or were you already doing well, some stuff before that? Well, at my police department, when you lose 50 pounds, guys notice, right? And they're like, hey, Reynolds, how'd you lose, you know, 50 pounds? And I start telling about keto. You know, not everyone wants to listen. You know, a few guys are like, all right, let me look into this. And I start a little group, you know, about five of us. Hey, dude, get off the Doritos, eat pork rinds, get off the sodas, do sparkling water, just suggestions, right? Cauliflower pizza crust. You know, not Kali Power, but some of the other ones that are out there, you know. And yeah, yeah, yeah. one guy lost like 50 pounds. My, you know, my buddy, man, and he started calling me, you know, 5-0 is Hawaii 5-0. And it's something they use sometimes when cops are coming, they're like, 5-0 is coming. And he kept calling me Keto 5-0. And other guys, other departments, guys that we knew, you know, started reaching out to me and go, hey, how'd you help so-and-so lose 50 pounds? I go, man, I was just giving him advice. I didn't do any. I wasn't doing blood work. I wasn't doing anything except teaching. So I started coaching. And I started coaching guys, you know, and then what was it? I think 2019, I retired from the police department and the stress was gone, you know, and my everything else kind of, I mean, it wasn't gone, but at least police stress was gone. And it just, everything's gotten better. You know, I met Doug Reynolds, a low carb USA, and he invited me to go to a sports nutrition school with Jeff Cotterman out there at, um, it's called a, I think it's a, it's a nutrition school out there. They go, I'm sorry, NASN, National Association of Sports Nutrition, not medicine, mm -hmm. sports nutrition. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I went there for six months over COVID and I was learning all about the different amino acids. And I was asking my wife how to say stuff, you know, cause I was like, I don't know how to say this. I don't want to sound like an idiot, you know? And so she's, it's all right, honey. And she's helping me pronounce, pronounce some of the medical terms. And it was a challenging course, but I learned so much more than I already knew and able just to now go, you know, I can go virtual guys, you know, and all I do is coach them. You know, most of the first responders, they just need a direction to go. You know, we're hard headed, but they tend to listen to me because I've, you know, my heart disease isn't there. You know, I'm sure they did a freaking autopsy on me. There's probably some kind of damage and scar tissue and stuff. For the most part, my blood works great. My cholesterol is still a little high, but that's the HDL. You know, I'm not worried about that stuff because my triglycerides are low. So everything was just man gelling and then my wife's decided let's sell our house get a trailer and travel the country while we're homeschooling our kids so then it just came like i was a snake oil sales salesman on the road everywhere i went hey you gotta try keto carnivore i'm telling you you get off medications you can you know help yourself to get your a1c down and all this stuff right and most of the people i meet and obviously in the kind of community of campers it's a lot of retired people that are metabolically sick they're heavy they're on medications. Um, it's funny. I, I always joke I'm going to start a dog business called Keto Fido. And it's going to help the dogs with their food because the owners seem to care more about their dogs than themselves. So if I get the dogs healthy, maybe I can, you know, get the keto carnivore to the adults or the masters, you know. But, yeah, I just started making contact with people and they just started, you know, you just talk. And I tell my story before or after, you know. And, and tell us a little bit about uh, being a police officer. And I know you talk a lot about uh, PTSD and how how keto carnivore helped in, in that area and, and, and helped to help many people suffering. Well, in my career in, uh, in 2012, I was in a shooting with a bank robber where he shot me and me and the other officer were forced to shoot and kill him. So after this, I had to go through recovery with my foot we got a lot of rewards and recognition. We got invited to Washington, D.C. for some awards. I mean, it was very, you know, it was awesome. And but then after t- time, stuff st- starts creeping in again. Every call I went to, I'm a little bit more hypervigilant. And then I stay that way. Even when I get home, I wouldn't calm down. You know, I start drinking more, eating to just, you know, I was just stressed. And every day I went to work, I, I was going to get another shootout. Right. And you can't tell anyone. So now it's just all kind of festering you know and yeah. over time it, it lets out on your family or you're you know just i don't know it's just very irritable and i was always easy very easy going before that incident happened and that was a very primal incident that put me in a weird place that i've never gone before you know and there's a big truck driving by so i apologize no that's, it's okay. that's camping like so anyways wow. you know when you know i started suffering about two years later it really started to affect me and didn't want to go anywhere you want my wife to go anywhere. You want my kids to really go anywhere without me. You know, I got to watch. I got to be there. I'll do the shopping. You know, it became this obsessive compulsive. I have to protect everybody. Right. And it was hard. Life was hard on my wife. I wasn't beating anybody. Or I wasn't breaking windows. But the relationship and the dynamics of us had changed at that point. And she had told me, you know, you need maybe you needed some help to go talk to somebody, you know, and what do you do at this point? You're a cop. You ain't going to tell your right. sergeant. He's going to tell everyone in the apartment, right? So there was one other officer, one of my majors that had been in a shooting before. And he goes, all right, let's send you to, I think it's uh, EAP, you know, just go talk to somebody, see what they say. And they say, yeah, you got PTSD. You need to see somebody. So I battle workers comp. I already had an active open claim with my foot and those injuries. So I was able to at least get the help I needed. But I had to fight workers comp. You know, a lawyer, a four, you know, four lawyers in a room made me break down in front of the whole room, talking about my story, make sure it was, you know, they wanted to really see if I was suffering, you know. Right, right, right. So physical injuries they can see, the mental ones they can't, right? So it's just it was a very stressful time. Whole department knows what's going on. They're gonna fire me if I can't do the job. You know, it was not an easy path, mm-hmm. but it was worth it. Because Dr. Barnett down there in Florida that I saw, he taught me how to dance with it. He goes, it's not going away. This attacked your central nervous system, you know, and you're just going to have to learn how to manage it, you right. know, through right. meditation. He never mentioned diet. I was still kind of big when I started seeing him. Um, but I taught him about the diet because as therapy was going, I was losing weight. And he's like, what are you doing? I go, man, you got to check out this keto scene, man. And 
it was awesome, man. And then over time, I realized I wasn't uh, obsessed with things as much. I was thinking mm -hmm. clear. You know, I got one of those, uh, you know, measures your step you know, yeah. bands or whatever. And I had a goal of 10,000 steps a day and then you started getting more. And then there'd be times at night where I was just short and I'm walking circles around my bed just to get to 10,000. Right. And then all of a sudden it was, it hit me. I was working on my feet more. I wasn't sitting down as much. My energy went through the roof. I was just like an ADHD kid, you know, which is probably how they're supposed to be. And we start messing with them, you know, that's one of the reasons we homeschool because my kid was like, he needs to be active. He oh. can't sit in a class six hours a day. He needs to run around, do his thing. Maybe two hours a day, we can get him in and go over some basic stuff. You know, But back to me, it was just, man, it was night and day. And then other guys I was talking to and then help, and they started talking about how much energy they had. And then I just started thinking about PTSD. I started looking up different um, articles on it about the cholesterol feeding your brain and then the inflammation in your body. It was just a whole body thing was going on. You know, I was healing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it was just, man, I couldn't wait to tell people. It's like that old joke, man. They always know when you're on keto or carnivore because you start talking about it all the time. But I'm trying to help people, man, because it's I, mean, I can't believe this was out there all this time my whole life. No one told me. No one taught me. It wasn't available in any literature I tried to find. And they know it. They knew it was there. I get so angry at it, you know. Well, it's interesting because I was in the operating room today and I have medical students that I talk to. And and sometimes they're just deer in the headlights. You talk about this stuff and it's so foreign, but they're they're not open to this possibility that diet alone may be the culprit in 99% of our diseases. Yep. And and here you are You've been suffering and you trip over keto carnivore and you're now sharing this and wondering, like, why is it that the healthcare system isn't like shouting this at the top of their, their, their lungs? Yeah, my experience with pharma and the medical association goes back. I was a cop in the 2000s. So that's when the opioid crisis was going crazy. Yeah. And I was in a vice unit. We did operations on pill mills and doctor shopping. And we arrested doctors with the feds. And I saw that ugly side of the financial gain that people were making with pharmaceuticals, with medical, bribing doctors or incentives for doctors to, to prescribe. And I remember sitting there on, you know, some poor old, you know, Boynton Beach, where I was a cop, is a retirement community, but it's a very active city. It's got a little bit of everything that you need. And I remember all the old people that would pass away, natural causes. We had to write down all the prescriptions that were in the house because you can't have the grandkids stealing stuff. You wanted to take the narcotics, you know, and the jewelry, whatever is valuable, kind of, right? And I remember my hand always cramping up, having to handwrite all the prescriptions because we have to fax that to the ME's office or the doctor, the doctor will sign. And I kept reading all these pills all the time. I'm like, man, this doc, they said this guy died of a heart attack and I'd have a big bag of pills. I go, this is what killed this dude. And that was just my own, you know, just perception on it. So then by the time I started getting brought into the medical field, like you should do this, you should do that. My wife went natural childbirth. No, none of this Doctors got golf at 10. We're going to have the baby induced at eight and he's out of there. No, no. My wife went 36 hours in labor each kiss. She breastfed three years. We're old school, you know. And so I saw it just with my birth and my kids, how the yeah. business side of it you know, is, you know. And we had a doula and we wanted to do a home birth. My, my wife was over 40 at the time. They're like, no, you got to go to the hospital. But anyways, I saw that side of it. So I... When I realized, especially Nina Teichel's book about the sugar industry and how they hit stuff and how they they knew it was going to cause an epidemic and they still let it happen. Don't, don't you wonder that, I mean, how do, how do all these drugs end up on the streets that that there must be some push by the someone that controls and is almost making sure this stuff gets out there? to addict us hey man what i've seen in organized crime i mean my mom was a homicide sergeant in, in miami in the 70s and 80s and we saw the drug cartels what they were doing and how they push products 
and they've gotten a hold of our freaking government agencies. You know, I mean, look what they're approving and what they're not approving and what they're blocking and what they're not blocking. I mean, I don't want to get us censored, but there's a huge, heavy side of pharma and narcotics in everything that we're prescribed and doing, and especially our food too. They're on the same team, all those guys, you know? Well, the, the, the addictive substances come from plants, right? They're in plants. Were, were recommended to eat a plant-based diet, low animal, low animal fat and no red meat. Right. And, and so in, in essence, it, it's almost, it's, it's hard to blame any of the people, the children, uh, the young adults, or even the adults who are addicted on these substances because they're, they're drugged. Yeah. And when you're drugged, you don't have control of your, your senses or your your ability to to say no when you agree yeah and when you tell them i you know like i haven't had really vegetables in like three years i mean maybe an occasional potato with something or and they're like you just don't need any vegetables i'm like nah and i don't really i don't need fiber either and they're like what i go no and it's just mind-blowing to them but you know you explain it and try to push them a certain direction and you know it goes from there but I couldn't believe that I could lose this type of weight, be healthy, be happy. And you know what? It didn't cost me anything. You know, that's the, that's what I figured out. I could eat cheap. I mean, it's not cheap carnivore. Don't get me wrong. But if you cut out other things that you don't need, you can make it work, man. Ground beef is pretty decent. You know, I mean, if you have to squeeze it in, it's still the master's meal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, we have at least four times a week, you know, how the ki- how how young are your kids? And- They're eleven and seven. Two boys. They've been, they have some sourdough bread, blueberries, strawberries, honey. You know, my wife does a broth tea for them in the morning, and then they'll fast, not on purpose, but they'll have their tea, and then it'll be like another hour and a half, two hours till they eat because we're homeschooled, so we don't have a schedule. Like you gotta eat lunch at ten, you know, and they eat, my eleven year old's eating almost as much as me because he's about to hit pre puberty, and he's he's an active, strong kid. My younger one's more that he has a little bit more of a sweet tooth. You guess that from mom, you know, but we don't have anything bad around. We don't have Oreos. If we do any type of cookies or flat, it's always like an almond flour, like simple mills, something like that. We'll take that to birthday parties. We pre-make everything. We show up with our own food. We're that family. And nobody cares. The kids don't care. The other parents are looking at us like, oh, my God, they brought their own food. I'm like, yeah, because that shit's poison. Would you feed your kid heroin or cocaine and just let them do it this one time? No. I go, that shit's addictive. I'm sorry. That stuff's addictive. And I'm not going to teach that to my kids at this age. You know, there's certain things you can do. Obviously, you know, it's blueberries and almond flour stuff and scoop of almond butter now and then is not going to hurt them. But they eat real clean, man. And they're such a good influence to other kids. Like my kids will be eating pork rinds while the other kids are eating like Fritos. And the kids are like, why don't you eat Fritos? He's like, because that's not really food. And he's like, look at the back. And he'll start showing them. He's already teaching a little Keto, Keto 50 mini me is teaching them stuff about how to read the back of, you know, boxes and labels and stuff. So are, uh, are, are other parents, other children making the move into the keto carnival world, do you think? My wife gets, she should have her own blog, but she's too private. She just likes to go one and talk to people, but she's always giving advice, you know, home remedies. You don't have to go get cough syrup. You don't have to go to the pharmacy for every ailment. You know, there's all kinds of natural stuff. Like my kid got poison ivy run around the woods in West Virginia. And, you know, she's got clay and clay toothpaste that we use. She puts that on there and, you know, and draws out the poison and, you know, nothing running to the hospital, freaking out like some parents do. But she's been, she saved me, man. My kids have saved me because I was an older parent, 42 and 46 when I had my two boys. And they got me trying to do parkour in the park, hitting my shins on stuff, rolling around. I mean, there it's, <laughs> it's so much fun, man. They got me so act, um, active, but, all the other parents are asking us questions all the time. So how do you keep your kids from not wanting cookies? We don't have cookies. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, Halloween, we don't give out candy. We give out pencils and rubber racer skulls, or we give out little beef jerky sticks. We're not giving out the poison. And our kids go collect it. We throw it out and we go buy it. We have a toy, that a Lego set or something that they trade their bad candy in for. You know, and, you know, hopefully we can, you know, change this whole candy giveaway. Everyone wants to give my kids candy all the time. Yeah, Lollipop. It's, Here's a, it's just, it's just, stop. Even the dentist. I'm like, get out of here. It's crazy. So, so tell me a little bit about 
the the uh, 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 cops for campers and where that's come from and what your mission is there. All right. So cops and campers was started originally. There was a, I was in another little documentary film in 28, 2017. That's what I was about 250 pounds. It took eight cops. We all got together in the Blue Ridge Mountains in a cabin. And one of the guys was a filmographer, Patrick Shaver. He did my Cops and Campers movie. At this time, he just filmed us talking, interacting, interviewed us. And it was so therapeutic to be around these guys that weren't tied to my department. They're all different agencies. And they became, some of them, friends for life because we'd all gone through different trauma and stresses. So I decided... A little incident in New York, you know, being a Florida guy, I'm not a big fan of New Yorkers, even though I'm a me- I am married a New Yorker. We ended, we ended up in New York and a campground had asked me to take down my thin blue line flag in 2021. Things were still hot with the cops versus everyone else mentality. And right, right, right. I wasn't thinking much of it. And the campgrounds said, take down your flag. And I told them, Mm-mm, you know, I'm not taking down my flag. And it turned into a little viral thing or I said some profanity to the guy and it was filmed. I got suspended from a camping club for being belligerent to the staff because it went viral. They had to do some. So cops canceled their memberships. Like, so I decided, I go, you know, what? let's just go to pro first responder campgrounds. We're going to put a list together and just go there. And I had four different campsites invite us to upstate New York from Ogdensburg to Cape Vincent to Ithaca and all the way down to uh, uh, Chautauqua. I learn all these new names sometimes. And they covered the week stay. They gave me golf carts. They had the local cops come out. We were exchanging challenge coins, which is a little military coin. And yes, it was yes. just, it was so much fun, man. And I decided after I met Scott here at Spruce Row, he invited me first. I go, hey, why don't we do a, an event? And we have a band here that's a bunch of retired cops. We had the National Guard out here with bounce houses for the kids. We had a chicken barbecue. You know, I'm trying to get a luncheon where I can get the experts like you guys to come do a meetup and they start helping these guys understand and at least come from a professional because they see me and they're like, ah, yeah, he lost weight eating meat, you know, and they can, I can get you in the doors what I'm saying. I get you guys in the door and we can help all these guys. So anyways, it was so positive that we filmed a documentary last year because I had a feeling it was going to be good. So mm-hmm. I asked Patrick, I go, hey, when well, you want to come, we'll give you a cabin, just film the weekend. And he put together a 30 minute documentary about a little bit about the flag, but pretty much about all of us guys getting together that don't know each other. We all have a story. We all are missing being part of the, the gang, right? That's what right. we, whether we, we all played sports, a lot of us, and then you get in or military and then you get into police work and all of a sudden you're, 50, 60 years old, and you don't have that anymore, right? So it's loneliness, depression. You're not part of the circle. And what this does is guys are now starting to say, hey, where are you going next summer? Where are you going at Thanksgiving? Now they're networking with other guys that they met. And what that does is because police work is high in suicide. Mm -hmm. You know, if they can just reach out the one guy they met here, hey, man, I'm having a bum day or I'm fighting with my wife or whatever. He's just got another voice, somebody else out there for him. And that's what I keep hearing from the wives and the husbands of, officers that are here because all the wives find their own little clicks or the you know i don't mean to say wise but a lot of guys i'm talking to the wives are like hugging me saying thank god you got roger out here because whoo he's getting hard to handle sometimes and i'm like all right we'll get him you know we just he's got to talk it out we got to get the booze down you know because a lot of the guys drink too much after they retire or why they're on the job so yeah it's still it's working but i want to make it bigger we got one coming to blue ridge georgia in august and then we're hoping to spread it through the, you know, Michigan. I'm being some people are trying to get me to go over there. And then obviously out west, Arizona, Utah, all those guys, they're looking for a big old rally, have some fun, you know. Well, there, there's certainly a, a lot of um, dissent and sometimes some negativity over our first responders or police officers who help protect us and take care of us. Maybe it's because we're not going out there and, and sort of connecting and sharing uh, but there are a lot of challenges that uh, police officers are experiencing, as you mentioned, uh, PTSD and 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 lots of other things. Because you know, it's it's um, we all live a hard life, and 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 certainly when you're out there protecting people, but you're constantly maybe put down or or not respected as as we should be. Uh, that's got to be really difficult. Yeah, after my shooting, you know, you would think, man, the guy was shooting at me first. I'm good, right? I, I'm covered. 
But then stuff creeps in your mind when you're waiting for the uh, state attorney's office to go over your case, public perception. I mean, we yeah. shot 38 rounds into that car trying to stop the threat. And he shot me twice. And he, sh I think he fired six to eight rounds at the other officer that was there. So, I mean, it was a gun battle for over two minutes. Wow. <clears throat> so when you lay there and in the end, I'm thinking, am I going to go to jail over this? Yeah. You know, that that can get that creeps into you and it it weighs on you, you know, and I know a lot of the other cops and first, you know, firemen, you know, ER doctors and stuff like that. Everyone that's involved in that world, you sell a piece of yourself for that job because some of the stuff we have to see is not normal, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and you take it with you. You know, you, yeah. you know I, I learned long ago, tell my wife everything. I try to not everything, but I have to let it out. Yeah. You know, yes. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. just not healthy, but. That's what this whole cops and campers groups about guys getting a lot of um, residual stuff in their careers out, you know, and it seems to be doing well. I mean, I'm gaining momentum, you know, and I'm I'm like loving the, the I mean, come on. I get to travel and see different campsites across the country and meet a bunch of cool first responders. I mean, geez, I just need to get them eating right. I got to get into the party and then we get them eating right. That's what we got to do. What do you think is the little the hook or the thing that helps them more than anything to sort of. Uh, change their 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 habits of nutrition and drinking, uh, like all of us. There, what I've been seeing, most cops, are, you know, we good guys, bad guys, right? Nice and simple. And a lot of the cops I know really don't trust a lot of the doctors out there. They might trust their doctor, but most in the medical. So I can always tell them, man, this is what my. I mean, I had a doctor three years ago looking at my blood work from two years before, trying to prescribe me cholesterol meds on an old report it was just a mistake i go all right that was two years ago i go what are you doing you're gonna prescribe me the wrong stuff but just being almost like a health advocate for them is big just to get them to open their eyes that there's other doctors out there that you could see virtual now you know you don't have to drive you know like down in florida one of the doctors we're always seeing is dr Sivas. you know robert Sivas. a lot of people want that ask me they're like where's he at jacksonville and it was in palm beach garden i'm like get there you got to see this dude Whoever is in this low carb keto world that's trying to get you to eat right rather than prescribed your way out of it, you know, you got to see these guys and they're starting to spread. I'm getting my mm -hmm. mom to see somebody in uh, Greenville, Tennessee. I'm going to go with her. I'm like, let's go, mom. You know, she's 72. She's from the old school. You know, she's like, really? And I'm looking at everything in her fridge and her cabinets. And I'm like, oh, man, you know, but I, she's an old homicide sergeant, so I can't come in hard. Yeah. She's not going to put up with it. <laughs> now, where are you this weekend? Are you, are you in Ithaca? I'm in Ithaca through the weekend. This is our event. And then we'll be heading down to uh, West Virginia and then back to Tennessee and then down to eventually uh, Blue Ridge, Georgia for the other ca Cops and Campers event down there. They got glamping there. Like you can do cabins. They even got tree houses down there if you want a tree house to live in for the weekend. So that one's going to be a pretty awesome one, too. Well, I'm working Saturday morning. And I don't know how long it's going to go, but I'm working to come on down and visit, by the way. Oh, that'd be awesome. Saturday night is the band playing Taylor Made. It's a little bit Southern rock. You know, they play some country and nothing crazy. And next year, I hope to have my buddy who's a reggae uh, artist come do Friday night. We're going to have like a Caribbean steel drums night. You know, dun, dun, dun. that always makes people happy, you know. <laughs> so so do, are you kind of uh, you're you're taking it as it goes. You're excited about this. You're sharing with others. What's the sort of the goal? Do you have a goal, a goal in mind or just uh, express it in organic and growing? It's kind of like I'm running my keto 5 world, you know, in the nutrition side. And then I got the cops and campers side. And, you know, I'm man, it's I'm busier now than I was freaking. At least I'm working for myself now. But yeah, they're coming together at times and I want to make them come together. And my buddy, uh, Greg McNair, he's the RV carnivore. His big rig is, you know, he was at KetoCon. He yep. has the Yep. So he's going to come next year with his rig. I mean, he had some other things going on, but. Man, that's the goal to do meetups with these events and then get the doctors locally that maybe can start taking on some new patients with these guys. You know, a lot of them just need a professional, you know, someone like you that Dr. Robert Kiltz can say, guys, this is what you need to do. And they'll be like, wow, I never knew about that. They'll believe it. But at least I can bring, like I was saying earlier, I can get them in the door and then you can sell them, not sell them, but you know what I'm saying? Open their eyes. It's another voice. I want meditation, I want stretching. 
these most of these guys can't even touch their kneecaps, let alone their toes. Yeah. You know, you got to be flexible. You know, you got to keep your body moving, walking. You know, I know walking. I love uh, Dr. Ben's uh, resistance training. I do that a lot. I'm in and out the gym without stretching or do a little cardio. I may be only touching the weights for 25 minutes, mm -hmm. all slow and steady, slow as I can. You know, sorry. Hey. Always time under tension, you know, always just pushing it, holding the weights for a long time. Just, you know, and it's been great, man. I love it. And I got my own weights. I carry around, you know, I'm out there doing my thing. I got a pull, portable pull up bar. You know, it's great, man. And people are just looking at me like some nutcase, but I'm like, man, you don't know how hard I work to get to this point. <laughs>